Well, hi everyone and welcome to the December to webinar. Um, presentation by Naomi and Latoya today from Suze Victoria. And um, I think we might just pass straight over to them and do the updates at the end. Would you guys like to start? Um, good. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're from Zoos Victoria. So we're going to be talking about the new wildlife detection dog program for Zoos Victoria and what we've been working on and what the future might hold. Um, so yeah, any questions obviously feel free to ask at the end. Um, and we'll probably give out our emails too if anyone wants to get in touch. Always welcome. So um, we just wanted to give you a quick overview of who we are. That's me <laughs> with a beautiful dingo, um, Nango, who's one of the uh, dingoes on site here at the Orchid Sanctuary. Um, my background is in various things, um, starting in animal technology, moving into wildlife biology, and also being a, a um, and then later doing certificate in um, dog behaviour and training and following on with the science honours in the effects of training on the dog owner relationship, different training um, methodologies. Um, I've also been working with conservation detection dogs for I think probably about five or six years now in a, in a part-time or casual basis. Um, slowly increasing over the years. And so this is a lovely opportunity for me to really, I guess, apply everything that I've been learning over that time. I'll pass you over to Latoya. So my background's mainly in research. So I did my bachelor's in wildlife science and then I fell in love with wildlife detection dogs. So I did my honors in quality detection dogs, looking at their accuracy and efficiency in comparison to camera trapping and human visual surveys. And then I recently just finished my PhD looking at improving how we're currently selecting detection dogs, the impact of a dog's breed on its training and working success, and also the impact that um, changing a dog's handler has on its welfare and its working performance. So as we said, we're currently working for Zoos Victoria and they are a zoo-based conservation organisation and they have um, projects both in situ and ex situ. So they're involved in captive breeding and release programs. They're also heavily involved in species monitoring and they also partner with a lot of different conservation organisations, um, either for research projects or as a financial supporter. Um, and where our program fits within that, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview and a background. Um, so in and some people here might be able to correct me on dates um, more specifically, but in 2016 or 2017, um, there was a pilot program done um, following a study that was um, commissioned to look at whether wildlife detection dogs would be a valuable asset to the Zoo Victoria program. Um, and part of that was developing a pilot program to run through some scenarios and um, establish whether, again, it was a good fit. So it was um, phase one was the pilot program and that was undertaken with the Canada development team. Um, you can see Rubble and Uda on the, on the screen at the moment, beautiful water collies. Um, and this program was focusing on two species, the Borgo frog and the plains wanderer. So the plains wanderer, for those who don't know, is um, a mainly ground dwelling in critically endangered um, bird species that occurs on the Northern Plains um, up into New South Wales and South Australia in significant decline. Um, and the bauble frog, as the name says, is the frog at Mount Bauble. Um, so I guess we would like to take this opportunity to really acknowledge the work that Canada Development did um, with the piloting of the program for Zoo Victoria because it's made our role significantly easier in selling it because it was so successful. So the project was deemed to be really successful at that point and so further um, commitment was made to develop an on-site detection dog program for Zoos Victoria. So that's why we're here. So for the second phase of the wildlife detection dog program, we have several aims. So one of our largest 
um, aims is about the welfare of our detection dogs, as well as the welfare of the animals that we're working around. Um, we're also really focused on completing research projects and we'll go through some of those potential projects a little bit later um, because we know how important community outreach and engagement is. Obviously getting our visitors and the community engaged in our program is also a large aim. But pretty much the reason that we're here is for the conservation of um, our wildlife species as well as field deployment, which we'll hopefully be partaking in next year. And finally, collaboration. We really want to collaborate with a lot of stakeholders and as well as hopefully the ACDM, if you'll have us. We'll force ourselves upon you. You won't have a choice. <laughs> so this is our very loose, very loose timeline. We're hoping to have our detection dog facility built by the middle of next year. So that'll be um, constructed at the Hillsville Sanctuary um, and starting then we're hoping between May and July, we'll be selecting our first lot of detection dogs. So we'll be um, having up to five dogs, but probably to begin with, we'll just have two. And then we'll be training and assessing dogs throughout middle to the end of the year. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have dogs ready for field deployment on their first target species. But during that time, we'll hopefully also be doing research projects and yeah, developing our program as we go. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview about the things that we've been working on um, whilst we've been in the role and not had the Victoria dogs. So we've been really developing the program and everything that it will encompass. Um, we've also been working with some interim dogs, which we'll go into a little bit more. But this is a little bit about what our facility is going to look like. Um, so we've designed a kennel facility which will house the dogs and, and our focus is 100% on welfare for our dogs. Neither of us have um, worked with kennel-based dogs before and so we are really conscious of the potential stresses and welfare implications of kenneling working dogs um, and we are going to every degree to minimise any impact on, on the dog's welfare. Um, and so our design has really focused on making that work for the dogs and also for working environment for us. Um, this is the kennels, you don't need to look at it in detail, but um, basically we've, we're allowing for five dogs at this stage. Um, and if anyone's interested, we can go into that in more detail in the future. This is a bit about our site. So on the left of the screen is the Corrandirk bushland. This is bushland, it's 117 hectares owned by uh, Hills Hill Sanctuary. And so this is where we will be spending a lot of our time. Um, it's an amazing resource for training opportunities, um, for replicating lots of different habitats that we might want to train dogs to work in. Um, and it's also pretty beautiful, as you can see. So we feel pretty lucky to be able to uh, spend time there. And on the right is a picture of <clears throat> more specifically where our kennel facility is earmarked to be built. Um, doesn't look like much at this stage. <laughs> and we've already developed our exercise yards. Um, the last thing to go in is some shelter structures, uh, but this is a bit of a snapshot of what they look like at the moment. We'll be growing some grass, hopefully. <laughs> Um, but we've, we've tried to um, give the dogs lots of enrichment opportunities so that they can um, enjoy as part of their daily life. So climbing structures, platforms to rest on, um, sand pits. We've got two yards, two quite big yards, which we can open up so dogs, if they get along, can share, as you can see with Roy Roy and Kip, who are starring in our pictures. Roy has lost weight since the photos <laughs> have been taken. We're working on conditioning. <laughs> So these are some of the species that we may potentially be training the dogs on in the future. So Zoos Victoria has 27 focus species that are on their fighting extinction list. So some of the species that we might be training on um, are mammals, are reptiles, birds, amphibians. So really the dogs will be expected to find quite a broad array of target species. Um, so we will hopefully be um, following in Canada Development's lead and we'll be training detection dogs on the Plains Wanderer and the Bauble Frog, um, locating both scat samples and, as well as live individuals, depending on where the 
information is currently lacking and where the need is. We're also, um, just to add to that, in the process of consulting with all of the different threatened species managers to tailor a program that really meets their needs. Um, so that's an exciting conversation that we're having at the moment. So during the interim, we've been doing a lot of writing and a lot of procedure and protocol writing. So these are just a snapshot of some of the stuff we've been working on. Uh, a lot of our focus has been on about their welfare in the kennels, we can best mitigate risks. Um, we're very lucky we have, or will have CCTV on the dogs. So we wanna ensure that we have um, procedures developed that allow us to best monitor their welfare in those circumstances. So we've been working on those plans as well as their whole of life plans. So starting from when we're selecting the dogs all the way through their retirement. Um, and then just other typical procedures about risk management, biosecurity, and all about field work and working schedules. As I mentioned, we're very passionate about research and we've had um, a lot of time to write down potential research ideas. So hopefully in the next year or two, we'll touch on some of this. Um, we're wanting to look at arousal and impulse control, specifically how we can best monitor this in our dogs as well as managing it. So we're ensuring that our dogs are really safe around wildlife. We're also wanting to look at scat degradation and factors that are affecting that and how a dog's ability to detect these samples um, depends on the level of degradation. As we've mentioned, we're also wanting to look at the impact of kenneling on a dog's welfare as well as their working performance. So there's quite a lot of literature out there that doesn't really show um, working dog kennels in a positive light. So we're wondering how our kennel set up and our management set up compares to this. We're also wanting to look at the impact that dogs have on wildlife. We often class um, detection dogs as a non-invasive method. However, there's not really much published in regards to how the dog's present in, presence in the field impacts behaviour and their overall welfare. And we're also hoping to look at eDNA, um, specifically in relation to detecting platypus and how dogs may be another beneficial method for that, um, as well as improving how we're currently selecting um, our detection dogs. A lot of research. We've got a board that just goes on and on and on, which we'll get to at some point. <laughs> um, in the interim, there's a couple of other little projects that we've been working on. Um, we've been developing a project that won't be so little, but it's um, in the it's gone in for ethics. Um, so we're waiting on ethics approval at the moment, um, looking at whether dogs uh, are using generalization as part of um, sorry, I'll start again. Whether we can use odor generalization as part of our training of um, wildlife detection dogs to streamline training, um, to potentially improve welfare of our target species, and um, to understand what the dogs are detecting and in what context. Um, so we're looking specifically at amphibian detection uh, for this one, where we'll be, and we can certainly talk more about this if people are interested in the odor generalization studies, but this is um, set to start hopefully early 2020. Um, and that's in partnership with La Trobe University. So like Latoya said earlier, we're really interested in those partnerships and how we can all work together to benefit our industry. Um, another little project that we've been working on is, um, locating GPS tags, specifically one that was lost in the field, um, which was designed to be worn by a lead beater's possum. And so this tag basically um, asked if the dogs could find it <laughs> because it had been lost. So we've been training for that and kind of assessing how the training's going and um, what are the factors that we need to consider in the training and whether it is actually possible. Um, and stay tuned, we'll probably write something on this in the future, but looking at the top picture of Kip and I in the field, that's the field that we've been working in. Um, and quite possibly won't continue with, given our findings to this point on um, what's happening with the detection of that bag. Um, another really cool project that we're very excited about is a zoo-based um, conservation project. So we've got a team that breed Tasmanian devils here. Um, they're obviously tumour-free and um, 
basically bred for conservation purposes. Um, and so we, one of the things that they need to do is address the welfare concerns of handling these um, devils whilst they're breeding or in estrus. Um, and so we're looking at whether we can use dogs to help them make. Specifically, they want to know if the devil stress and should be um, paired with males and also whether they're lactating and have pouch young without actually having to physically restrain them and check their pouches for pouch young. So that's a project that we've also got um, in for ethics quite soon and, and hopefully we'll get started with in 2020. So a few months back, we were very lucky and privileged to be invited to the conservation dog Kui in New Zealand. Um, and we met a lot of really cool handlers and trainers doing really amazing work. So the Hui is basically the gathering that they do once a year. And it's two days of sharing knowledge um, and experiences and training. And then followed by two days of workshops, demonstrations um, for training, as well as assessments. So that was a very amazing experience. We're also lucky enough to see a penguin detection dog working in the fields. <laughs> as, oh, hurry up. <laughs> as well as a kiwi detection dog demonstrations, which was amazing to see. And we spoke to handlers about not only our Zuzvik program, but also the ACDN. So hopefully we'll have some Zealand handlers and trainers get involved with the network and sharing their amazing knowledge. And we're forcing them all to come to the conference uh, next year as well. So they're, they're under pressure. A lot. <laughs> Um, some of the cool things that we learned. So I guess we wanted to maybe not dive um, into a lot of detail with our New Zealand trip, um, but we really there were some things that we really took away that have resonated with us that we can apply or consider more um, for our program. So one of them was the use of surrogate species for training, and so we're investigating that more in terms of whether it's a surrogate species or it's a surrogate odor. Um, and, and how applicable that is and in what context um, and how useful it is. It's certainly something that seems to be a great idea superficially and um, we'd like to understand more about it. Um, we also, it was quite interesting looking at the way that the dogs were worked and trained using their instinctive drives. So like gun dog style training and it's something that I've not had a lot of experience with. So I, um, I'm quite fascinated about this style of training really using the dog's instinct um to benefit detection um and so that's something we're looking into more in terms of particularly positive gun dog style training um, something that we're delving into a little bit at the moment um, another cool thing that we learned and the the guy that presented on this um scott hopefully we could potentially organize to do a presentation with us at the acdn um, he's very passionate about what he's producing new gps technology so it's um, I probably shouldn't go into what because I don't understand it well enough but from what I understand it's a small unit that the dog wears in a vest um, which is similar in the way that we will use our um, tracking collars but it also uploads things automatically for us so it streamlines the way that we um, manage our data once we've collected it was quite interesting to hear about and I, I'm certainly keen to hear more about it so we might try and tee him up at some point to talk about what he's working on. Something that I took away from the um, HUI, which was the, the first few days of information sharing, was that it was really lovely to hear them sharing their successes and their stories and what they've been working on, but also their challenges and the things they tried or they would like to do differently. I think it's something that I took away that I would like to always continue to do is go, um, I learned from situation and this is what happened and and hopefully sharing it will help other people learn from those things as well it was very refreshing there were some really honest people um there so that was i really liked it. i liked that and sharing we're done <laughs> we're <laughs> So yeah, we're happy to take questions now or um, can certainly share our email addresses if anyone would like more information down the track. You'll be able to find us at the Zoom most of the time.
Thanks for that. That was awesome. Um, I have a question straight up. I have two actually. Um, I just want to ask about the frog generalization you mentioned. Does that mean training, mm -hmm. training the dogs on a, a generic frog scent and then taking them to an area um, such as where the bore frogs are? Uh, are they the only frogs there? Is that why you can do this <laughs> generalization and just use them to find all That's frogs? exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yep. exactly. Hit the nail on the head, Emma. Um, it was a, a question from one of our um, amphibian researchers was, could we just have a frog dog that finds all the frogs um, and then we take it to these niche environments where we know there's only one or two species and then they tell us everything that's happening in that environment. Um, but we can then apply that same dog to lots of other things. And is there a way to streamline that training so it's efficient? Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the nuts of what we're doing. Nuts. And, <laughs> Wrong way. Yeah. and how do you think, also um, to look up. just wondering how you might think that might affect the dog um, in terms of being somewhere where there's abundant frogs just by chance while it's looking for something else um, and whether that's going to have any implications in doing it in this method. I don't think we'd be doing it without working dogs. I think this is mainly a proof of concept. So if we were to say train a dog on all frog odors, we'd probably exclusively be using it in an area where we knew that there wasn't a high abundance of frogs. So it's probably not something we're going to start recommending that everyone does. But. We're also looking to get some insight into, we're comparing a couple of different training methodologies and looking at which ones are more effective for that sort of those biological standards. There's a lot of stuff done on, you know, drug detection dogs and whether you combine Sonia will probably be able to tell us more about all of this but the, um, hopefully tomorrow whether, <laughs> whether you're combining all the odors together or um, introducing them all sequentially yeah. or um, and so we're really looking at that from a specific focus of the amphibian show. And then on top of that do you can you just train dogs on frog swabs or do you need to train them on live, live animals also? So just yeah. Again, it comes back to the welfare, um, and we we would like to not handle our threatened species if we can avoid it. And so, is this a way that we can increase welfare in that context? With the surrogate species, mm -hmm. is that where you'd be training them, like on a different type of frog, and then seeing if is that what you mean by surrogate species? Yeah, yeah. So, but it was. Are they doing that in New Zealand? Not with frogs, no. But with um, other animals. Yeah, um, and it seems to work quite well. I, from what I can gather, it seems to be a bit of a traditional style of training for gun dogs. Um, again, like I said, I don't know a lot about that style of training, so excuse me if I'm incorrect. What, what, what are, they, are they surrogating for what? Uh, pigeons and quails. Yeah, they, you would have to be considerate of what species you use in terms of whether they are existing in the same environment that you're planning on working your dogs in. Um, but they, that, that's, they've been doing it for a while and it seems to be working quite nicely. And I think you're right, Naomi. I think there's a lot of background in hunting dogs um, in those methods. And yeah, we do have a selection criteria and an evaluation that we'll be using and going through. And we'll also be evaluating that evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. That's really cool to hear that you're going to be. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And as for braids, yeah, just find the unicorn. I don't care what it looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bought a terrier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll talk to you about that more tonight. <laughs> And what's this instinctual drive? What's what? Tell me more about that. So it's really a lot of the dogs that we saw working um, in New Zealand were really trained based on those. Um, I guess what's the right word? Traditional gun dog style training methods, um, where you're really using the instinct of the dog and then just setting them up so that they understand what you would like them to do with that instinct. Um, and I think that, I mean, it's probably not that, it's not novel because it's been done for a very long time, but it's novel to me. Um, and so it's, 
it's really looking at what does the dog instinctively do at that point where they see that bird or smell that thing or whatever it is and how they utilize that for their benefit um and so yeah i quite that i'm quite interested in yeah the gun dog side mm. of things um and knowing more about it does that make sense yeah um, I'd just like to point out, Naomi, it might be worth a trip down to Phillip Island, um, spend a bit of time yeah. with Craig down there. It's on the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've been hounding him, don't worry. He, he was at um, New Zealand as well. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah, we'll be going down and hanging out with him for a bit. And certainly you'll probably find that Alex is also training under those methods, um, given the start exactly. of the yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. Um, so. I have another question. Are you actually going to be training on southern bentwing bats? Is that one of your target species for the dog program? Yeah, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> and um, I'm obsessed with that. We're obsessed with that. Good, because I'm doing a lot of research on southern bentwing. So I'm just wondering, um, are you looking at finding evidence of them, scat, or looking at trying to find alternative um, overnighting sites potentially, or we don't know yet. We, we need to talk to the um, recovery team, the stakeholders. We need to talk to the threatened species manager at UV. Um, but probably, I mean, if you asked us specifically, all we're of the doing things. it, yeah. <laughs> um, but we're just waiting on, um, I guess, progressing that idea more, but we're very keen. Yeah. So when I say we're doing it, I mean, we've has told us they're allowed to do it yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea. I do a lot of bat research and there's nobody knows anything about bats, obviously. And it would be really interesting to have, um, using that generalisation that you were talking about, we don't even know where bats are sleeping in the landscape or roosting over, um, yeah. Yeah. during the day. So it would be fantastic if we could, even if it doesn't end up being southern bentwing, which I know is your target, but it would build up the picture a lot. Well, why don't why don't we organise to take up about that tonight? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. At your new property. Okay. Sounds great. Um, <laughs> oh. We'll we'll narrate it. That sounds like a good idea. There has been a little bit of research in the past on using dogs to find roosting sites and yeah. Yeah. places like that. So I reckon it would work very well. Yeah. yeah. On guano, detecting and um, roost, and roost, like roosting heights in the trees, and and what level was um, roosting height meant that like generalised to what efficacy with the dogs, um, but it was one study, so they fleshed out more. Yeah, I think the guys over in America as well, the rogue detection teams. I think oh, they yeah. have a a bat detection dog. Okay, cool. There. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. That's cool. Thing. Yeah. All right. Do we have any more questions? I'm writing it down. For Naomi. Thanks for listening to us. Thank you. Thanks for talking. <laughs> Thanks really for presenting. Awesome project. Well done. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's fun. It's um, still very much a work in, in progress, but um, it's all, all good. Yeah, well, I think it's very exciting. All the stuff you have planned, you know. Yeah, it's very cool. Really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we can assume that maybe this time in two years, we'd love to have you back. Maybe not December. Mm -hmm. um, we'll let you have a Christmas party. <laughs> maybe not. Thank <laughs> you. That would be nice. For that. But it would be fantastic. We'd love to come back once we've got more to report. Yeah, keep some updates going because that's uh, really exciting what's going on. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. All right. Cool, well, cool, cool. Thanks, guys. We will um, enjoy your evening. We will. We're just going to wrap up. We'll say goodbye to you guys. I know you're keen to go, but before I stop recording, um, I just wanted to do some member, um, some announcements for those people listening at home. Um, membership for the ACDN will be available in early January and that will be through the website. We will make an announcement and you'll get an email about that soon. Um, the, just a reminder that we have our conference on the 20th and 21st of August. Tickets will go on sale for that in January and abstracts will be open late December, early January for those that are wishing to submit an abstract. And we are 
accepting abstracts from practitioners and researchers. So just to not deter any of the dog handlers or trainers out there, we'd love to hear your stories too. Um, we have an AGM on the 18th of December this year at 7 p.m., which is next week. It will be a short meeting, hopefully within half an hour, if anybody would like to join us for that. Um, and I just wanted to ask if anyone else has any updates or announcements that they would like to make before we end the recording. I was just gonna quickly say that in our next webinar in February, it's gonna be a Zoos Victoria double bill because we have uh, Lydia Whiteway who's gonna be talking about the Guardian. So, right. so yeah, that's gonna be the next webinar. Nice. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's us again. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm just going to... get that email? Result. <laughs> I'm going to stop. All right. Super. See you later. I will see you guys tomorrow.